Since it was established in 1921, the South African Reserve Bank has been steeped in the contours that shape the country's history. The bank steered through the introduction of a single currency, the devastating impact of the Great Depression and the subsequent abandonment of the gold standard. World War II institutionalized racial oppression and segregation. The introduction of the RAND in 1961, the oil crisis of the 1970s, the dawn of a new democracy, the global financial crises, threats to its constitutional independence, and today, the COVID-19 pandemic, the worst virus outbreak since the 1918 Spanish flu. The roots of Africa's oldest central bank are emblematic of the political developments of the time. It mirrored the society in which it was founded, first seen as an English-speaking institution, and in later years, shifting to an Afrikaans-dominated institution. This remained for 73 years to the exclusion of other population groups. For much of its history, women's staff were relegated to administrative positions at considerably less pay compared to men. Consequently, the political and economic conditions in the country deteriorated with each passing decade, from the 50s to the 70s, and finally... Good morning, and welcome to the South African Reserve Bank Ordinary General Meeting. As you are all aware, South Africa is currently under adjusted level three lockdown due to the COVID-19 pandemic, with the third wave sweeping across the country. Stringent measures remain in place to prevent COVID-19 from spreading in the interest of everyone's health and well-being. These measures have once again impacted on the manner in which the 101st annual ordinary general meeting of the shareholders of the South African Reserve Bank is conducted, namely online as opposed to a physical meeting at the bank's head office in Pretoria. I hereby welcome you to this virtual meeting and declare this 101st AGM of the shareholders of the South African Reserve Bank duly constituted in terms of the regulations framed under the South African Reserve Bank Act number 90 of 1989 as amended, herein after would be referred to as the sub-act. Please be advised that this meeting is being recorded for future reference if required. Any shareholder attending this AGM is eligible to ask written questions related to the business of the meeting by selecting the messaging icon and typing your message in the chat box at the bottom of the messaging screen. Messages can be submitted at any time prior to a matter being put to the vote. Shareholders' questions will be answered during the meeting, and both the questions and the answers will be recorded in the minutes. However, should questions from shareholders be received after the closing of the poll and question time, they will be responded to directly via email. All shareholders attending this AGM who hold 200 or more shares in the SAP and who are entitled to vote in accordance with the provisions of the SAP Act and its regulations will be allowed to vote at any time before the vote is closed. Allow me to introduce my colleagues who are joining us today to answer any questions that the shareholders may have. They are Deputy Governor Kuben Naidu, Deputy Governor Fundi Chasivana, Deputy Governor Rashad Kasim, Chairperson of the Audit Committee, Terence Nombembe, Chairperson of the Remuneration Committee, Yvonne Mutian, former Chairperson of the Board Risk and Ethics Committee, Firoz Kachalia, Chairperson of the Non-Executive Directors Committee, Lerato Mulevati, General Counsel, Chris van der Waal, and Secretary of the SAP, Sheena Reynolds. Allow me now to move on to my formal address. We convene our 101st Annual Ordinary General Meeting more than 18 months since the first COVID-19 case was reported in South Africa 
And the third wave of the virus infections has peaked. Restrictive measures have been necessary to protect human lives with negative effects across our economy, leaving deeper scars on businesses and on the economic livelihoods of many South Africans. While the magnitude of the economic shock has been difficult to estimate, the South African Reserve Bank responded quickly and aggressively with a broad array of actions to limit the economic damage in line with its constitutional mandate, constitutional and legislative mandates. The policy responses in, in, included the use of monetary policy, market operations to support the functioning of financial markets, regulatory tools, as well as collaborations with other entities to provide relief to the economy and support lending to households and firms. In addition, the SAP has been contributing in global forums aimed at fostering greater international co cooperation to strengthen the global financial safety net. Monetary policy was adjusted rapidly with the SAP's MPC cutting the repo rate to an all-time low of 3.5%, leaving the prime rate at a 54-year low of 7%. These low rates have supported household demand for credit and have cushioned corporates through low short-term rates while allowing government to take advantage of cheaper short-term debt. Liquidity management also shifted quickly to address funding strains in the domestic markets through the utilization of the repo facility at various maturities. The intraday repo rate offered 36 billion rands daily, while the weekly and three month funding windows made 45 billion and 20 billion rands available, respectively. To add liquidity and promote the continued smooth functioning of the bond market, the SAP implemented a bond buying program in the secondary market. The value of the government bonds purchased totaled 41 billion rand. As a result of these actions, liquidity conditions in the money market and the government bond market normalized quickly and market functioning was restored. The Prudential Authority in the SAP granted temporary regulatory and supervisory relief measures to enable banks to continue lending and supporting their customers. The relief measures were provided in three areas, namely lowering the liquidity coverage ratio from 100% to 80%, lowering the minimum capital requirements, and relaxing the provisioning requirements in order to permit the restructuring of distressed loans. The PA also issued guidance to banks discouraging dividend payments and executive bonuses in 2020. This measure has since been reversed. Finally, the SAP partnered with the National Treasury and the Banking Association of South Africa to establish the Government Loan Guarantee Scheme. As at the 19th of June 2021, 18.39 billion rands in loan had already been approved by banks and taken up by small businesses under the scheme. There has been criticism around the low uptake of the loan guarantees. It is important to note that the loan guarantee scheme was a backstop for cases where the commercial banking sector was unable to provide credit relief to borrowers due to high credit risk. In practice, banks responded quickly and very successfully, acting swiftly to support the firms to which they lent. In addition, small and medium uh, businesses appear to have been reluctant to take up more debt, especially in an environment characterized by deteriorating confidence, a sluggish recovery, and heightened economic uncertainty. But what were the economic developments that against which this backdrop took place? On the global front, economic recovery is on track, but it is uneven. The International Monetary Fund, a July World Economic Outlook projects a stronger recovery in both 2021 and 2022, with growth projected at 6% and 4.9% respectively. The advanced economies, led by the United States, look set to reach pre-COVID-19 levels much sooner than their emerging and developing economy counterparts. The US continues to pursue unprecedented fiscal expansion and an accommodative monetary uh, stance. 
Most recently, the European Commission passed its next generation EU stimulus package in conjunction with its multi-annual financial framework 2021 to 2027. These significant policy responses will see a fiscal injection of just over 2 trillion euros in the European Union member states over the coming years. Economies in Sub-Saharan Africa continue to lag their peers. Coming into the pandemic, most of these economies were already battling with a lack of policy space and sluggish implementation of reforms necessary to boost growth. Slow vaccination rates will continue to weigh on economic recovery in this region, even after the lifting of hard lockdowns. Many economies in the Sub-Saharan African region continue to struggle with high debt levels and conflicting policy priorities, including the need for higher health care spending, the strengthening of social safety nets, improved fiscal positions, and kickstarting much needed infrastructure projects. Against this backdrop, the regional economy contracted by an estimated 1.9% in 2020. The IMF forecast growth uh, of 3.4% in 2021 and 4.1% in 2022 for Sub-Saharan Africa. The COVID-19 pandemic has caused large demand and supply shocks globally. The policy space to respond has been varied across countries, depending on pre-pandemic economic conditions, as well as the risk perceptions of funders and investors. These demand-related challenges were the short-term uh, difficulties. The longer-term challenges are harder to address as they concern supply. The pandemic has disrupted global and domestic value chains and has destroyed businesses and jobs. It will take time to rebuild our economies to pre-pandemic levels. Supply constraints also contribute to higher inflation. So as we recover from the pandemic, this raises the prospect that over the medium term, monetary policy may need to retreat from its highly accommodative stance. Much of the financial market volatility we have seen in recent months reflects how markets assess these monetary policy dynamics, including how monetary policy may be constrained by negative supply shocks and impacted by the ongoing expansionary fiscal efforts. The US Federal Reserve has indicated that the higher inflation outcomes of recent months are primarily transitory and are therefore not expected to result in permanently higher inflation. Nonetheless, the Federal Open Markets Committee has shifted its position, perhaps signaling a somewhat earlier normalization of monetary policy than was foreseen last year. Across the Atlantic, the European Central Bank has finalized a revised, uh, has finalized a revision of its strategic uh, framework, setting a clear inflation target of 2% and thus moving away from the pre previous articulation of below but close to 2%. This has clarified the target and removed uncertainty about potential policy responses if inflation were forecast to rise above 2%. But what does this mean for the domestic economy? Since the last AGM, we have seen the domestic economy recover faster than expected, although output remains 3.3% below real 2019 levels. The first quarter gross domestic product figure for, of 4% quarter on quarter, seasonally adjusted and annualized, surprised on the upside. However, the recovery remains uneven and is largely driven by strong performance in the finance and mining sectors. Mining has been benefiting from rising commodity prices, and manufacturing appears to be benefiting from improving global and domestic demand. Finance and trade, also linked to improving demand, appear to be closing in on the 2019 level, in step with uh, manufacturing, while 
agriculture has benefited from high rainfall and bumper harvests in 2020. However, construction and tourism related activities remain well below their 2019 levels. Transport, impacted by reduced travel for both commute and leisure, also remains well below the 2019 levels. The recent unrest and economic damage could, however, fully negate these better growth results and could have lasting effects on investor confidence. As a result, our GDP growth forecast for 2021 remains at 4.2% for now. Prior to the unrest of recent uh, events, the soft economic indicators were pointing to a more positive outlook. The Business Confidence Index, measured by the Bureau for Economic Research, rose to the 50-point neutral level for the second quarter of 2021, the first time in seven years. The APSA Purchasing Managers Index and the SASHI Trade uh, Expectations Index remained in expansionary territory. Consumer confidence, however, softened in response to uncertainty about the economic outlook and income rising from renewed COVID-19 infection rates and the slow vaccine rollout. The recent events, electricity load sharing and lockdowns will continue to weaken near-term sentiment in the economy and pose risks to growth. The official unemployment rate has up marginally in the first quarter of 2021 from 36.5% to 36.6% as more people re-enter the labor market, but job growth remains lackluster. Headline inflation accelerated from 4.4% in April to 5.2% in May, largely on petrol, food, and base effects before easing slightly to 5.9% in June. Core inflation remained subdued at 3.1% over this period. Risks to the inflation outlook emanate mainly from global factors such as higher food and oil prices, as well as global supply disruptions pushing up producer prices. However, a stronger exchange rate economic slack, and modest housing-led service price inflation continue to moderate inflation outcomes. Additionally, higher domestic crop production should help mitigate food inflation pressures. A key strength of the South African credit story has to do with the strength of our financial system. But there have been factors that had impacted on our system and I would like to address this now. The COVID-19 pandemic found our financial sector resilient due to continued enhancement to our regulatory and supervisory framework. The regulatory capital ratios for both banking and insurance sectors remained at roughly the same levels at the end of 2020 as they were before the onset of COVID-19. This is attributed to a moderate level of credit extension, keeping profitability in the banking and insurance sectors positive, and capital retained by measures that reduced dividend payouts. Asset prices have rebounded in line with economic activity, and the rate of loan defaults continues to stabilize. The JSE all share index, the ALSI, has fully recovered the losses suffered in 2020. House price growth has also improved in recent months, achieving positive real growth for the first time since 2016. While the banking sector's loan defaults may not have peaked yet, the pace of increase slowed significantly in late 2020 amid signs that borrower debt service capacity was improving. The value of credit restructured as a result of COVID-19 has more than halved from its peak in mid-2020. Nonetheless, material risks to financial stability still exist, and we continue 
to monitor them. They relate to the durability of the economic recovery, the high and rising level of public debt in South Africa, and the potential for global financial conditions to shift abruptly. Let me turn to the operational matters that the bank had had to deal with uh, over the period under review. The work that uh, we have done, uh, we have to do as a central bank, also includes ensuring that our national payment system remains robust and that we keep up with changes brought about by advancements in financial technology that result in new payment methods. During the reporting period, the SAPS National Payment Systems Department launched the real-time cross-settlement systems renewal program. The RTGS system enables payments by members of the public, merchants and corporates, as well as government entities through accounts held by their, by their banks at the SAP. With the renewal program, the SAP aims to widen access to payment services, enhance competition through the leveraging of technology developments, reduce the cost of the system, lower the transaction fees, and make the system more flexible and adaptable to relevant changes in the financial sector. Earlier this year, the intergovernmental fintech Working Group published a position paper on crypto assets. The paper provides a roadmap for putting in place a framework for regulating crypto assets in South Africa through the regulation of crypto asset service providers. The paper makes 25 recommendations related to cross-border financial flows, consumer protection and market abuse, as well as containing money laundering and combating the financing of terrorism. The second phase of Project COCA, through which the SAP practically explores the potential impact of distributed ledger technology on financial markets, is also nearing its final stages. The final report will be published by the end of September this year. As we look to the future, the SAP, like many other central banks, has embarked on a central bank digital currency feasibility study. The objective of the study is to investigate if it would be feasible, appropriate, and desirable for the SAP to issue a CBDC to be used for retail purposes, complementary to cash in South Africa. This is our 101st AGM. But guess what? This year marks 100 years of the SAP's existence. Over the past century, we have steered through the devastating impact of the Great Depression, the deadliest war in history, I mean the World War II, institutionalized racial segregation, the oil crisis of the 1970s, the dawn of democracy in our country, the global financial crisis, threats to the SAP's independence, and today, the COVID-19 pandemic, the worst virus outbreak since the Spanish flu in 1918. This year, we also celebrate the 60th birthday of the South African rent. We celebrate 25 years of central bank independence following the adoption of the Constitution of the Republic of South Africa in 1996. And we are also celebrating 21 years of the inflation targeting framework in South Africa. In celebration of its centenary, the SAP has launched a commemorative five rand circulation coin. This coin illustrates the journey of the currency minted by the SAP from the iconic tiki to a glimpse of the future Tencent coin. We also held a virtual ceremony shared with our stakeholders. We had uh, former governors and importantly, our staff. We were honored to host the leadership of yes, yesteryear, 
including the seventh governor of the South African Reserve Bank, Dr. Christans, the eighth governor of the South African Reserve Bank, Mr. Tito Mboweni, and the ninth governor of the South African Reserve Bank, Ms. Jill Marcus. There were also messages of support from BASA, from the IMF, from the Bank for International Settlements, and from the broader central bank uh, community on our continent and uh, elsewhere. The messages reflected a deep respect and admiration for the institutional strength of the SAP. In October this year, the SAP together with the BIS will be hosting a virtual biennial conference themed policy challenges after the pandemic. The conference will explore some of the main challenges that central banks and macroeconomic policymakers are facing in the wake of COVID-19. In bringing my, uh, this address to a close, I have to express my gratitude to and would like to commend the hardworking staff of the South African Reserve Bank. When we convened last year, I outlined measures to transition our staff to working from home. I'm happy to report that while most of our staff members continue working from home, they are well equipped and have been able to continue executing their respective tasks diligently. We are working with the health authorities um, to vaccinate uh, the staff of the SAP across the country. The impact of COVID-19 on our health system, on our society, and on our economy has been enormous, drawing parallels to the flu of 1918. The institutional framework through which the SAP exercises its functions has enabled us to respond to the economic impact of the crisis with scale and with speed, while balancing short-term and longer-term trade-offs. To rebuild our economy, jobs need to be created. Businesses must be restarted and new ones must be established to align with the changing economic needs. Investment decisions need to be taken. Our national policy frameworks must facilitate and enable those basic economic decisions consistently and sustainably, providing cost-effective and reliable network services, education, and many other quality public services. As we navigate through this current storm, a multi-pronged policy approach is required with all institutions of government responding in line with their defined rules. The SAP will continue to play its part and deploy its tools as appropriate in accordance with its mandate to continue providing support to the South African economy and building buffers to enable us to navigate new storms that may hit our shores. As we look to the next 100 years, we remain committed to anchoring our work in a strategy that takes account of fast changing economic environment. This is a time to rebuild. This is a time to repair, making our country fairer, more dynamic, and inclusive of all South Africans. This brings to the end my formal uh, address to the AGM. And I would now like to turn to the formal business of the day, which covers the following matters. Firstly, to receive and accept the minutes of the AGM held on the 31st of July, 2020. Secondly, to receive and consider the SAP's annual financial statement for the financial year ended 31st of March, 2021, including the director's report and the independent external auditor's report. Thirdly, to approve the remuneration of the SAP's independent external auditors, namely PricewaterhouseCoopers Incorporated and SNG Grand Thornton Incorporated for completing the audit for the 2020-2021 financial year in terms of regulation 22.1 subsection B, read with regulation 7.3 C of the regulations. Fourthly, to approve the appointment of PricewaterhouseCoopers Incorporated 
and SMG Grand Fontaine Incorporated as the SAP's independent external auditors for the 2021-2022 financial year. Fifthly, to elect three non-executive directors to serve on the SAP's board of directors. And finally, to consider any further business that may arise from the items just mentioned in terms of Regulation 7.3e of the regulations. I confirm that the Secretary of the SAP has not received any requests for special business in terms of Regulation 7.3d of the regulations. I now invite Ms. Sheena Reynolds, the Secretary of the SAP, to confirm the shareholder representation at this meeting. Sheena? Thank you, Governor. Um, I'm pleased to confirm that the total number of shares in the issued share capital of the Saab is 2 million. In the meeting today, we have 39 shareholders present online, seven shareholders are represented by proxy, and 440 votes are exercisable by the shareholders present online and those holding duly certified proxy forms for this purpose. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, uh, Sheena. I have determined that the voting on each of the matters under consideration at this AGM will take place by means of a poll. This virtual meeting, as well as the voting procedure, are being facilitated by an independent external party, Lumi Technologies South Africa Pty Limited. We now proceed to the business of this meeting. Voting will start on the four, first four ordinary resolutions, namely the acceptance of the minutes of the 2020 AGM, the acceptance of the annual financial statements for the year ended 31st March 2021, the approval of the remuneration of the SAP's independent external auditors in the amount of 16,486,550 excluding value-added tax, and the appointment of the independent external auditors, Pricewaterhouse, Coopers Incorporated, as N S and SNG, Grant Thornton Incorporated for the 2021-2022 financial year. I can confirm that the mandatory rotation of audit partners do take place as required, and that the audit partner at PwC has rotated for the 2021-2022. Uh, audit. Are there any questions or comments on any of these matters? Uh, Sheena, I hope you are watching the chat box if there are any questions there. Governor, there are questions, um, but none of them relate to these particular four um, uh, votes. Voting um, so of these resolutions. Okay, we'll deal with that. Uh, and then with that, then I uh, would declare that the polls are open and you can now exercise your votes. Are they still seven? Jay, we are waiting for three. That must be slow, maybe. Jay, we are ready to close the voting. 
Uh, the polls are now closed and the results are Okay, resolution one, um, 25 abstentions and 359 votes for. Resolution carries. Resolution two, uh, 325, two, 324 votes for, uh, five abstentions and the resolution carries. Resolution three, 326 votes for, two against, one abstention, uh, resolution carries. Resolution four, uh, 324 votes for, five against, zero abstention, resolution carries. Thank you very much, Lumi. Let me turn now to uh, the election by shareholders of three non-executive directors. In terms, the terms of office of Dr. Yvonne Mithien, a non-executive director with knowledge and skills in the field of commerce and or finance. Ms. Shamima uh, Gaibi, a non-executive director with knowledge and skills in the field of labor. And Mr. Norman Mbazima, a non-executive director with knowledge and skills in the field of mining, expire tomorrow, the 31st of July, 2021. All three incumbents are eligible and available for re-election by the shareholders. The panel appointed in terms of section 41C of the sub act considered the nominations for the three vacancies. The panel comprises of myself, as the governor of the sub, Retired Constitutional Court Judge uh, Yvonne Mohoro and uh, Mr. Abel Setrona, Chief Executive Officer of the Public Investment Corporation, both nominated by the Minister of Finance, and uh, Mr. Kaiser Moyani, Mr. Trilani uh, Tifuta, and Mr. Bekin Jalinjani, all three nominated by the National Economic Development and Labor Council. The panel has confirmed four candidates for consideration by the shareholders for the three vacancies in terms of section 41G of the sub -act. The panel is satisfied that all four candidates are eligible as well as fit and proper to stand for election as directors of the sub. The CVs of these four candidates were sent to the shareholders together with the notice of the meeting. I now turn to the election of a non-executive director to fill the vacancy for a position with knowledge and skill in the field of commerce and finance. Dr. Yvonne Mithian was the only candidate selected for the ele uh, election in this category. Please exercise your vote by voting for or against Dr. Mithian or abstain from voting. Are there any questions relating to this? Well, if there aren't, uh, Lumi, let us open the call. There were no questions on this matter, Governor. Lumi, how are we doing there? Can I close the poll? The poll is closed, Chair, and the results are on screen. Okay, and the results are as follows. 366 for, 
and uh, 15 abstentions. On the basis of this, I declare that Dr. Muthian has been re-elected as a non-executive director with knowledge and skills in the field of commerce or finance. Uh, congratulations, Dr. Muthian, on your re-election as non-executive director. In terms of Section 5 of the SAAP Act, this appointment shall be effective from the 31st of July 2021 to the day after the AGM in 2024. I now turn to the election of non-executive director to fill the vacancy for a position with skill, with knowledge and skills in the field of labor. Ms. Shamim Makaibi was the only candidate selected for election in this category. Please exercise your vote by voting for or against Ms. Gaibi or abstain from voting. Sheena, any questions? No? Okay, the poll is now open. Poll is now closed. And the results are 353 votes for, six against, and uh, 74 uh, abstentions. On the basis of these voting results, I declare that Ms. Gaibi has been re-elected as non-executive director with knowledge and skill in the field of labor. Uh, congratulations, Ms. Gaibi. For, on your re-election as a non-executive director. In terms of Section 5 of the SAP Act, this appointment will be effective from the 31st of July 2021 to the day after the AGM in 2024. I now turn to the election of non-executive director to fill the vacancy for a position with knowledge and skills in the field of mining. The following two candidates were selected for consideration and election as a non-executive director with skills and knowledge in the mining sector namely Dr. Musiri Mahaye and Mr. Norman Mbazima. Please exercise your vote by selecting only one person from the two candidates. Please select the number on your voting device that corresponds with the person you wish to elect, or if you choose to abstain from voting, please select the corresponding number on your voting device. This is displayed on the screen now. Any questions, Sheena, in the chat? Dan Governor. Thank you very much. The poll is now open and we will proceed with the director election. Governor, just a note to shareholders, once you've made your selection, please kindly press the send button. And your option should be highlighted in gold when um, you are completing your voting and you should have a message that states what your option is that was received. Chair, I'll just give them another 30 seconds to vote. The poll is now closed, Governor. Thank you. And the results are 246 votes to Mr. Norman Mbazima and 139 votes to uh, Dr. Musiri Mahaye. 
Well, um, uh, on the basis of these results, I declare that Mr. Norman Bazima has been elected as an executive director with knowledge and skills in the field of mining. Mr. Bazima, congratulations on your election as an executive director. In terms of section five of the sub act, this appointment will be effective from the 31st July 2021 to the day of after the AGM in 2024. I would like to thank Dr. Mahaye for being willing to stand for election to the board and trust that she will continue to take a keen interest in the work of the sub. This concludes the voting procedures for the day and I would like to thank Lumi for their assistance and contribution. As mentioned earlier, the Secretary of the SAP has not received any requests for the shareholders for special business to be placed on the agenda of this meeting in line with the regulations. But are there any questions uh, uh, or comments arising from the matters under consideration uh, at this meeting? Sheena? Chair, there, there are questions. They're not relating to the matters, but, but if you'd like to take them and see if you can answer them. Um, if you're ready, uh, there we go. Let me have put it on the screen. So the first, there are three questions from Kosinati Maseku. He first of all asks about the South African Mutual Life Assurance Society, which has for the past decade held more than 10,000 ordinary shares, um, which is in contravention of the Saab Act as amended section 22 of subsection 1A. The act clearly states that no shareholder may hold more than 10,000 shares, but it's amusing the shareholder by the name of South African Mutual Life Assurance continued to hold more than 10,000 shares and no action redress nor order issued to the shareholder to dispose those shares. Why Saab is not taking any action regarding this contravention. Uh, would you like me to continue with these other yeah, two questions? Yeah. Uh, 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 Chris van der Waal, uh, this question comes up every year and the answer remains the same. I'm going to ask you to repeat the answer. Thank you, Governor. Okay, the next... uh, move to the next. Let's take the other questions while Chris is preparing himself. Will do. Thank you, Governor. Section 23, subsection 3 of the Act clearly states that a shareholder who is not an ordinary resident of South Africa shall not be entitled to any vote in any meeting. It clearly serves no purpose nor importance to have shareholders who attend meetings without voting rights. Instead, this deprives an opportunity to ordinary South Africans that are eager to participate at Saab as shareholders. I therefore propose and humbly request to the board and minister to review the act and allow only South Africans to be shareholders of the bank or disallow any foreign nationals. Um, and then the third question is, the Minister of Finance happens to be a shareholder of Saab. He's allowed to vote. As, is he allowed to vote as a shareholder? If so, I believe the Saab board should check any conflict of interest that may arise. Um, there are okay. another four questions, Governor, but I don't know if you'd like to do those three first. Uh, let's just take uh, Mr. Bar Rath's question as well. Okay. Uh, uh, Mr. Rath asks, can South Africa keep on increasing sovereign debt at the rate of the last five years? Okay, good. Uh, Chris van der Waal, let me start with you. Thank you, Governor. Um, uh, the first question, uh, if we can just go to the first question. This is a legacy issue um, and it dates back to prior to 1949. The SA Mutual Life Assurance Society held shares in excess of 10,000. Uh, the 10,000 uh, limitation was regularized in 1949. Uh, and the issue of holding more than 10,000 through associates was regularized in 2010. Uh, the second part of the statement is, is, is not correct uh, because uh, in terms of, and I would refer the shareholder to section 22 and section 23 of the Act, uh, in terms of the Act, the uh, shareholder may uh, hold 
uh, more than 10,000 shares, uh, but they are only allowed to vote 10,000 shares. So the additional shares are not voted. Uh, that's the same answer that we have every year on this one, and it's in terms of the, the act as it stands. On this uh, question on section 23, um, you know, I suppose this is not the forum to uh, debate possible amendments to the act and lobby for amendments, but um, from a legal perspective, uh, this is the legislation and this is what the act says. Uh, uh, shareholders, external shareholders or non-resident shareholders can hold shares, but they cannot vote those shares. And um, uh, therefore, I suppose this is a discussion uh, not for this forum. Uh, the third question, uh, the Minister okay. of Finance. It's okay, Chris. It's okay. Okay. Um, uh, I think that the appropriate thing, just not just the forum, uh, this question can be addressed to the Minister of Finance. Uh, we do not write the law, we administer the law. Okay. You can move to the, uh, uh, to the conflict uh, with the Minister of Finance, Chris. You are muted, Chris. Yes, thank you, Governor. Um, Governor, in, in terms of the Act, there is no limitation on the Minister holding shares. And uh, as we've seen uh, through the voting today, uh, and in terms of the Act, uh, the rights of shareholders are quite limited. And there's no opportunity for the Minister to influence uh, monetary policy uh, or anything uh, uh, on the operations. Uh, of the work that the SAAB does in terms of uh, holding the shares. Uh, and uh, the bottom line is in terms of the legislation as it reads, there's no prohibition against the minister holding shares. Thank you, Governor. Uh, thank you very much. DG Naidu, I want you to deal with the loan guarantee scheme. Uh, sure, thanks, Governor. Um, let me just go to the response. Chair, the loan guarantee scheme Thanks, Chair. Chair, the loan guarantee scheme is a partnership between commercial banks and the National Treasury. Uh, the South African Reserve Bank played a facilitating role in the development of the scheme, but we took on no financial risk directly. Risk was shared between the banks and the National Treasury. Banks did support their clients through loans, rescheduled loans and payment holidays. This was largely done on their own balance sheet. The risk sharing arrangement in the loan guarantee scheme was one where the banks took on the first loss up to eight and a half percent of the total amounts lent. Beyond this, the treasury would stand guarantee on the loan. Just under 20 billion rand was lent to about 16,000 small and medium sized firms. Chair. So Chair, the Saab was not a direct in participant in the scheme. It was essentially a partnership between the banks and the National Treasury. Uh, they shared risk between themselves. Uh, in our view, the scheme has played a positive role. We would have liked it to have played a bigger role, but it has certainly played a positive role. Taken in combination with what else the banks have done to support their customers. In this crisis, the financial sector has played a positive role in mitigating the impact of the crisis. Unlike in previous crises where the financial sector uh, often contributed to the downturn, uh, in this case, the financial sector helped to mitigate the crisis. Thanks, Chair. Thank you very much. And Mr. Gother, uh, Rath, uh, your question about rising uh, sovereign debt is a fiscal uh, issue that is for the National Treasury to deal with, it's not for the SAP to deal with. However, in the most recent uh, financial stability review, uh, we go into detail about what we call the sovereign banking nexus, which basically says, what are the implications of the financial sector holding this increasing chunks of uh, uh, government debt? It is not just a South African uh, phenomenon. It has now become a global phenomenon as uh, uh, the financial sector and the central banks had stepped in to um, pick up the debt as governments provide, uh, provide stimulus. Uh, but the issue of sustainability or otherwise of the sovereign debt is a matter for the Minister of uh, Finance. 
DG Kasim, if you could deal with the CBDC feasibility uh, uh, study, uh, they start asking what, what the status of the feasibility study is. The study is underway, uh, but uh, maybe you have some color to add. DG Kasim? And then Chris van der Waal, prepare yourself for the most recent trading price of the subshares. Kasim, you, if you are speaking, you are muted. You are unmuted now, you can speak. Okay, why don't you figure out what you are doing there? Chris Van Der Waal, can you give us the most current trading price of the sharp share, please? Yes, uh, Governor, uh, over the period of the last three months, uh, the average share price was at 12 rand 54. Uh, the minimum price paid was 10 rand and the maximum price uh, 17 rand. Thank you. Thank you. Rashad, have you found your voice? Uh, your voice, you are muted, Rashad. Okay, he says he's blocked. He is blocked. His microphone is not working, Chair. Okay, his microphone is not working. Okay, let me say that the, the CBDC feasibility study is uh, uh, underway. Um, uh, we can't say where it is uh, uh, at the moment. Uh, it involves uh, checking what is being done uh, globally and what is going on in our own payment systems uh, uh, space. And once that uh, feasibility study has been completed, it will be released for, uh, for, public, uh, for public comment. Uh, but it is uh, not uh, really uh, as yet. Uh, Ms. Christine and uh, Mumalo, uh, your point about transparency uh, with respect to banking customers and them having to complain to social media is a valid one. Uh, unfortunately, the banking ombudsman is not located in the SAP. It's an independent uh, ombuds. But with the Twin Peaks uh, model now, the Financial Sector Conduct Authority is... Um, uh, overseeing the process of uh, treating customers fairly, and uh, it is the responsible authority for uh, market uh, market conduct. And I think at the moment they are actually currently running a, uh, a public campaign where they are uh, saying that institutions are expected to treat customers fairly, and us as the financial sector conduct authority, we will hold them accountable uh, for that. Uh, that advert is currently. Uh, running. It's actually in the newspapers today. So you can uh, actually look at that and follow up uh, and follow up from that. We just double check. Okay. Uh, uh, Christine, we have got a particular limit as a central bank. And our remit is that of price stability in the interest of balanced and sustainable uh, growth. You can't deal with poverty outside uh, of growth. Central banks do contribute to growth by ensuring that there is financial and price stability. We affect cyclical growth, which means is short-term growth and the fluctuation of growth around its potential. For us to achieve sustainably high growth that will make an impact on poverty and unemployment, we actually need to raise the potential growth rate of this economy. That calls for structural reforms. And those reforms are in the hands of government and um, its various, uh, various uh, departments. And that is where that question needs to be uh, a, a directed to. In terms of the Financial Sector Regulations Act, we also have to contribute to the issue of financial 
uh, inclusion, which basically says that within our limit, we have got to try to make sure that as many people as possible are able to come into the financial system and thus benefit from the functioning what, what? of uh, the financial system. Thank you very much for uh, that, uh, Christine. And Sheena, I do not see any other uh, questions. There are no other questions, Governor. Um, thank you uh, very much for those questions and for your interest. Um, I know uh, that Mr. Adrian Gore is on the line, the Chief Executive of Discovery uh, uh, Limited, and he had requested to uh, address uh, uh, this uh, uh, meeting. Adrian? Um, Governor, I hope you can hear me. We can hear you very clearly. Just can't see uh, you, but we can hear you. Oh, I hope you. Oh, I'll, I will speak anyway, Governor, if that's okay. Um, I hope I have my. That's good. Camera. Yeah, we can see you now. Ah, great. So, so Governor, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Um, on behalf of the shareholders of the South African Reserve Bank, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to deliver. A vote of thanks uh, at this very important 101st uh, AGM, which marks the 100th year of the South African Reserve Bank's existence. In many ways, uh, the context in which the Reserve Bank was opened in 1921 uh, mir mirror our current circumstances. The world was recovering from one of the greatest and most tragic epidemics, the Spanish flu, which killed about 50 million people and led to significant economic decline. Today, as we battle another global pandemic, COVID-19, as well as facing local economic challenges, we look again to the institution of the Reserve Bank to provide stability and monetary policy leadership in times of uncertainty. In this light, the bank acted quickly and effectively last year to limit damage to the economy through a range of monetary policy instruments. As we see signs of recovery with the country returning to level three and the national mass vaccine program gaining momentum, we have every confidence that the Reserve Bank will continue to provide sound and flexible monetary policy frameworks. Having said all of this, Governor, I'd like to make an appeal to you going forward to balance responsible management with convicted, positive leadership. Sentiment during this time will surely be critical. It may be a contrarian view, Governor, that fundamentals follow sentiment, not the other way around necessarily. Obviously, and in this context, the recent period has been complex and, tra and tragic, with the pandemic and the unrest compounding existing challenges of poverty, unemployment and inequality. With unemployment at more than 32%, in the first quarter of 2021 and the pandemic costing 1 million jobs, despite some reco recoveries, our challenges are certainly real and significant and the need for strong leadership uh, is, is fundamental to solve. However, my appeal is to take our strengths and progress into account alongside our points of difficulty. All is not lost. We need to seek positive signals right now. While the most recent unrest resulted in more than 300 deaths, tragically, it was, it was undoubtedly a huge shock to the economy it need not be a long-term disaster. As summarized by RMB's chief economist this week, there will be positives resulting from restocking, replacement and rebuilding, and the knock to our recovery need not last long. In addition, the national vaccine rollout is progressing well. With over 7 million doses delivered and more than 2.6 million people fully vaccinated. The capacity to, to deliver vaccines is increasing, with private and public sites together having, having capacity to deliver the national target of 300,000 vaccines per day uh, in August, and we expect this to climb to over 400,000 per day in September. This rate per capita puts us in line with the gold standard globally. Surely strong in institutions are now critical during times of crises. Uh, and it's important to acknowledge that our institutions have held despite being severely tested. The Reserve Bank is fundamental. It is a strong and independent institution and the role it plays in keeping inflation under control in the best interest of society and the economy cannot be overstated. In closing, I'd like to, th to thank the Reserve Bank Board, Governor Kanyaho, the Deputy Governors, Executive General Managers, and all the Reserve Bank staff for their leadership, integrity and resilience during this time. This is an institution of which we look up to and are immensely proud. Thank you for the opportunity to address you and thank you for all you do. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Adrian, for those uh, uh, for those kind words. Um, uh, much really uh, appreciated. If there are no other matters, then uh, uh, Sheena, uh, you said there aren't, but then to the best of my knowledge, all the business included in the agenda for today's meeting has been transacted. 
the sound working relationship between the national treasury and the sub has continued and i would like to thank the minister of finance mr tito Mboweni, deputy minister of finance mr david masonto the director general mr Dondo Mohajani, as well as the staff of the uh, national treasury uh, for their ongoing support sincere thanks are due to the members of the board for their contributions and for ensuring appropriate corporate governance in the sub i would especially like to thank professor kachalia for his nine years of service to the board as his tenure came to an end on 17 july 2021 we wish him well in his future endeavors and uh, since he uh, he was a government appointed non-executive director we look forward to receiving confirmation of his replacement in due course from the president of the republic of south africa Sincere appreciation is also due to Deputy Governors uh, Naidu, Chasivana, and Kasim, as well as the entire management and staff of the SAP for their continued dedication and support during what was once again a challenging year. I would like to thank them all for their contributions. I'm confident that uh, their continued efforts will ensure that the coming year is even more successful. Thank you to all the shareholders and guests for your attendance and participation in this AGM. And I trust that the staff uh, can continue to count on your support uh, in the future. Lastly, a word of appreciation for uh, President Cyril Ramaphosa, Deputy uh, President uh, Mabuza for their unwavering support and commitment to the work uh, of the bank. Your uh, support during these uh, difficult times when there are challenges to institutions and to institutions of our democracy, but particularly about the role of central banks in dealing with pandemic is much appreciated. I now uh, have come to the end, we have now come to the end of uh, our proceedings. And I now declare this the 101st annual ordinary general meeting of the shareholders of the South African Reserve Bank closed.